Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this is a little bit different than what we've been doing. This is a uh, recorded live uh, panel. And um, the topic of our panel today is gonna be uh, what we call the post COVID workplace and what that looks like. Um, and you'll see some of us talk a little bit here. We don't really know what post COVID looks like. Um, is it post COVID or is it you know in the middle of COVID? And so um, we're just gonna be talking through some ideas. Um, we're gonna be talking through what things that we talked about before COVID that maybe don't register anymore or they're not relevant. And then how do you combat those? So joining me today, I have a couple of people. So I'm gonna start with Justina Georgeson. She is our uh, business development manager with Steelcase. And then we have Kim Antizdel. She is our design portfolio specialist out of Kansas City, but she's um, a really familiar face here in Omaha. And then um, from Shepherds, we have Ken Sigmund. He's our education solution specialist. And then we have Joe Netto. She's our architectural solution specialist. So they are all going to be consulting with me, but um, I wanna give them a minute to talk a little bit about their background and what makes them specialists and what makes them um, join me today and relevant in during all this. So Justina, um, if you wanna start. Hi everyone, as Taylor mentioned, um, my name is Justina Georgeson and I bring with me 20 years of experience in the commercial interior design industry here in Omaha. I started as a commercial interior designer and worked um, at various architectural firms and then moved over to a sales role with Momentum Group Textiles, as many of you knew me as your Momentum rep. And about nine months ago, I joined the Steelcase team and I am your business development manager and I am based out of Omaha, Nebraska and I office out of the SBI and I am your Steelcase manufacturer's representative locally here in Omaha and I work directly with uh, Shepherds and Taylor and uh, all of us together as a team. Thanks, Justina. And then Kim often comes uh, in partnership with Justina. So Kim, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm Kim Antisdal. I am your Steelcase to Design Portfolios representative, and um, I have been in the commercial industry for about 15 years um, in the design industry. I started as an interior designer and then just like Justina, switched over to the sales side. I've been with uh, Steelcase almost 10 years, and um, I, I like to say I'm the artist formerly known as Coalesce. Um, many of you probably remember me back from when I was just Coalesce rep. And then um, and about 24 months ago, we started taking on, we mean Steelcase, taking on some additional partners and manufacturers um, kind of underneath that ancillary umbrella or away from the desk umbrella. And so my role switched to the Steelcase design portfolios, which means that I specialize in anything that is not behind a workstation. So, um, and, I, and as Taylor mentioned, I'm based out of Kansas City, but um, this has been like a nice side effect of COVID that I get to see you guys all virtually and I don't have to drive so far. So it's, it's working out well for my gas mileage. Yes. Thanks for having me, Taylor. Sure, Appreciate it. Thanks for joining. And then on the Shepherd side, um, I got Ken and Joe. Ken, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Taylor. Yes, I'm Ken Sigmund. The vast majority of my prior experience has been in, as an education administrator uh, in the higher ed sector of education. Uh, I joined Shepherds about four years ago, and over these past four years, it's been a deep dive into active learning and what active learning is all about, um, and helping move the conversation here in the Omaha metro area away from the typical classroom rows and columns type structure to a more active, uh, collaborative group learning environment. Uh, the basic driver behind that is helping teachers and shift their instructional pedagogy towards um, one that helps enhance those skills of the students the full, built around the four C's of 21st century learning, uh, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, Ken. And Joe, finally, but not least, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you everybody for joining. Um, my name again is Joe Netto. My background is in interior design. I have been in interior design for about, uh, I think about 12 years, more on the residential side, did some commercial. Um, and I joined Shepherds about nine months ago as the architectural solutions specialist. And what my portfolio consists of would be our demountable wall systems, uh, our thread system, which is an under carpet um, power, and as well as um, 
I also do some other things for the Smart and Connect, which would be like our room wizard and um, those kind of things. Um, I, I love the opportunity to be able to um, to take part in this because there are a lot of changes. And the one thing that I'm feeling as far as our architecture solutions product is the word flexible. There are so many flexible um, characteristics of our solutions, um, architectural solutions products that I'm really excited to share with you about because that's that's one thing that we really need to be more uh, cognizant of is being flexible during this time. So. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. And um, before we move on, just so you all know, I'm Taylor Hoskins and I am the a and Solutions Specialist. And I uh, have the great privilege of working with every single one of these people. And you probably see them with me all the time. And that's because uh, they are your resources. And so that's my job is to support you um, as a and firms uh, and bring what they have to you because it's, it's really good information. So um, thank you all again. And then um, we're gonna start off. I Something that's a little interesting that I wanna think outside the box about is, um, you know, before COVID, uh, a lot of people know Steelcase as a research-based uh, company that makes furniture. And Shepherds is the steward of that. And so which, what we were talking about before COVID was the ancillary spaces, the collaboration, the creativity, and bringing people back from the office to into, or back from home into the office. So which of these areas and places that are currently set up are gonna see um, a problem now? And so um, I wanna talk a little bit with Jo, um, with her ARC solutions, um, mainly like I know meeting rooms, a lot of areas of collaboration. What do you see um, is gonna be problematic going back to the office? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that we have almost every office has is, you know, obviously conference rooms and how most of them are set up now is that you have a large table with six plus chairs around the table. And obviously now that we have uh, more rules set as far as, you know, we really need space in between each other now, that is going to be a major problem. Um, you know, we, we really need to um, limit the number of people in these enclosed spaces as well as heighten the sanitation um, protocol. So there's a lot to to rethink in this space. Mm -hmm. And um, Kim, I'm going to jump to you if that's OK. Um, what about collaboration areas? What about these ancillary spaces? What are some of the things that we're going to see maybe that once we're fine, maybe now problematic? Yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of spaces um, change, particularly in the ancillary category where, you know, before COVID, it was all about, like you said, collaboration. And that actually became a word that was used so often that it started. It's it's almost like now collaboration, the new collaboration is COVID, where we just are saying it so much. And what does that actually mean? And with, with these smaller ancillary spaces, I see the issue with the smaller ones. So um, like Joe was saying, smaller meeting rooms, areas where people are kind of in close proximity. So we're going to see a lot of protocol changes more than more than just around the furniture. We're going to see um, protocols around what we call clean in, clean out, where, for example, if you're going into a small conference area, once you step inside, you immediately take wipes and wipe down all the area, have your meeting. And then before you leave, you would take those wipes again or different wipes, wipe everything down, leave again. Then the next person that comes in is also going to clean before they begin. So you're essentially getting a double cleaning on both ends of the spectrum to allow um, for that that kind of post COVID world. And I think we're going to continue to see those protocols change. Um, same thing with how we're dealing with furniture in what I would call the pass through areas. Like if you're thinking mm -hmm. behind um, like a workstation, you might before have had a setup where it was a bench with some some things. Now we're maybe seeing a rise in um, shielding behind that. And it'll be a protocol change where it used to be that somebody might come and peek over the side of that um, that shield and start talking to you. And maybe that's gonna be a different behavior now where they aren't going to do that anymore. So we're gonna have to figure out ways for that natural progression of people speaking and sharing and, and talking to one another. We're gonna have to change how that happens, whether it's via Teams or just different protocols. Right. That's so interesting. And and that even leads me to then think, Ken, education, you know, education with the active learning and the move towards those spaces that, you know, encourage collaboration. What are we going to see there? So I, I think that collaboration does not go away. It's still a critical part of learning. It's a critical part of, of what we do as professionals. It's just going to be a different way you collaborate. It's going to be a different mindset around spatial distancing as you collaborate. So 
I think those spaces spaces will still be there. Um, I think in the education world, some of the key concerns or, or thoughts would be just space in general. If you picture a typical classroom uh, at any grade level, but a typical classroom you know, may have 28 to 30 students crammed in an 850 square foot classroom or a 750 square foot classroom. Uh, you cannot spread those students six feet apart and get 28 students in those same spaces. So just the constraints of the space itself uh, will be probably the biggest concern uh, in the classrooms. Also picture this, picture a, a high school hallway if you've been in one recently during transition, the bell period. It's crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's it's shoulder to shoulder, you know, you are on top of each other traveling through those halls. So that's the kind of thing that all the educators are going to be wrestling with as they go forward. Now, the good news, the positive uh, piece in all of this, perhaps at least one of them, is that schools had already been transitioning uh, and the mindset in schools, which for so long had been in pretty stuck uh, in their traditions, has shifted towards a more open consideration of change. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, schools are changing. They've been trying to think through how do we go about change, the increase in technology in the classrooms, uh, the use of blended learning in some of the classrooms. All of those things that have been happening pre-COVID uh, have actually helped us during this crisis and they will help us going forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. Um, and then that leads me to you know, Justina, so in all of these spaces, everyone touched on materiality. And I think with your background in in materials and moving forward, you know, can you touch on a little bit of, of materiality and which ones are we going to see a little bit more concern and maybe which ones are going to be our friend in this? You know, I know the CDC has changed that um, COVID might not pass as easily with surfaces. So is this still something we should be worried about? We definitely should, and I believe as a whole, the industry is going to see a shift to um, all surfaces being more cleanable, uh, whether that be bleach or uh, different protocols that are already in place. Uh, now people will start thinking about not just the cleanability of those materials, such as, you know, a, a hard panel versus a fabric panel or um, thinking about not only cleaning, but also sanitizing those spaces. And there has been a lot of thought around um, internally with Steelcase on how do you promote uh, a, a the, how do you promote workers being able to take control and feel like they're going back into that safe environment. Um, and we have a lot of thought started around different sanitation stations. So our belief is that we'll see these stations per se in education, in healthcare, in um, you know the workspace, so that workers have the ability to take control of their own cleaning, whether that be you know grab a Clorox wipe or a hand sanitizer, um, and so those will be in addition to the cleaning protocols that will be enhanced and put in place by the facilities group um, or the environmental services groups as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's um, fantastic and. So moving into, so we talked a little bit about pre-COVID and what problematic areas might we see. So in the post-COVID return to work, I think here we might refer to it as more of, you know, how do we live with COVID? How do we um, work with COVID? And so I want to talk a little bit about this area of before people actually return to work and before we start to reconfigure and, and reinvent the way we work, um, how, can, how can these companies help employees to feel safe? I think employees are concerned with turn, you know, returning to work. Anxiety is there. And so um, what's that going to look like? So I want to talk a little bit with each of you about each of your vertical uh, markets and you know, what are we going to be seeing that needs to be done before the return? So I'm going to talk with Ken first. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what do schools need to think about before returning back to, honestly, the most densely populated gathering spot probably right now, especially with young kids who might not understand COVID and, and how to keep the germs away. So how do we um, prepare for that? 
So that is such a huge question, Taylor. Um, you know, the, the administrators uh, and the educators out there, they're in the middle of a, a process right now, pivoting from crisis management to a more forward thinking uh, scenario building uh, planning situation. Uh, they did a tremendous job in all of a sudden being told schools are closed, yet you've got to educate our students for another two months. Uh, by and large, that went uh, phenomenally well, much better than I really expected it to go. Uh, there are pluses and minuses, right, for every situation. But anyway, I think it went pretty well, all, all considered. But looking forward, you know, what do we think about? The things to consider are immense. And I made a list of just a few of them. Um, of course, a vaccine is going to solve a lot of this, right? But we aren't going to have one of those anytime soon. So uh, testing, uh, how much testing can we have done prior to schools, prior, prior to the students coming back in schools? Contact tracing. Uh, student hygiene. Uh, hygiene for students, particularly in the younger grades, isn't the greatest uh, anyway. Uh, what is it going to look like? <laughs> <laughs> <The greatest. laughs> well, that, that's true. I don't, I'm not sure where that cutoff is, Kim. You're right. Uh, middle school can be pretty tough. Uh, yeah. But anyway, student hygiene. What do, we, what do we have to think about there? Um, facility cleaning and sanitizing. Um, Justina talked about that. That's a huge issue in the schools. Masks, no masks. Social distancing. How, how in the world can we do that within the space, within the buses, within dorms, all of those particular areas, food services. Um, school nurse stations. This is an interesting one. I was uh, spending some time this weekend with a superintendent from a very small school district, and I mentioned the whole idea around uh, a school's nurse's office. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember them being very, very small spaces, practically a closet that a volunteer nurse would come in and spend a few hours a day. His comment was, oh my goodness, we don't have nurses in our school, right? I mean, all these things that you've got to start thinking about, what does a school nurse's station need to look like now? Uh, temperature testing, uh, symptoms assessment, uh, a space to isolate children that you think may be symptomatic all of a sudden. Uh, big considerations, and they go on and on and on. Uh, busing in K-12, dormitories in higher ed. Um, so what are, the, what are the answers to all those questions? We don't know. I do know this, though, that educators around the world are heads down right now, uh, planning it all out and coming up with scenarios. One of the things I could say with some certainty is blended learning is here to stay. Some form of distance learning and and uh, online learning uh, is here to stay. I believe that there'll be a change in the academic calendar. Um, something I heard just recently is, and in fact, here in Nebraska, the uh, state uh, superintendent of education, uh, or the chair of the board of education, excuse me, has said, build your calendars, assuming that the semester, this fall term has to end by Thanksgiving, because uh, health experts tell us that there's gonna be a resurgence or a very uh, difficult flu season, season potentially. So we need to prepare for that. Hmm. That's really, that's fascinating because you're right. You think about the kids, a lot of times the flu season s sparks once they go home for Thanksgiving because you have your college kids coming home and you have families traveling. So I think that's a really interesting um, thought. And I want to uh, honestly focus on a little bit of the wellness. And Joe, if you don't mind me coming to you, um, I would like to talk about, I think, first of all, um, Ken will talk a little bit later about how corporate and, and education can really learn from each other. But in terms of what Ken is saying about the nurse, what do you see corporate companies doing? You know, I mean, A, are they going to have to have a nurse on site to test and to help kind of regulate that? Or is there not going to be a nurse? But if there's no going to doctor's visits anymore, like, are we going to have to start thinking about a type of wellness room that accommodates that? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, thanks for that question, Taylor. Yeah, healthcare professionals are really adjusting to the changes presented with this uh, pandemic. You know, personally, I had to meet with my doctor over a tele teledoc system several weeks ago and obviously the teledoc would be more of a, um, you know, uh, online 
meeting. Um, and then I did have a chance to meet with him um, just this past week, and he expressed to me how strange times are for his practice in particular, and that, you know, he would have never imagined um, treating his patients over a digital platform. So today, you know, the investments in telehealth is really growing. Um, it's growing rapidly as the number of users are growing. And this is really due to the potential for um, virtual care virtual care to achieve better health outcomes uh, by containing any viruses spreads, you know, while you are also decreasing the cost for the patient and the clinic. You know, research has um, just recently has shown that the number of telehealth visits for the last year was at 50 million and the expected growth is 81 million by 2022. Now this this research was done pre-COVID. So we're wow. anticipating that those numbers will even be more. So what is right now, what they're looking at are virtual rooms that are gonna be installed in workplaces, in the community and retail um, locations. So workplace areas, would you kind of see them in like well-being hubs um, at organizations, you know, where um, it's just like maybe it's a shared space in a large office or manufacturing facility. It gives the opportunity for employees to meet with their healthcare without actually leaving the office. Mm -hmm. um, and in the community, you're going to find these maybe like in veteran facilities or uh, school and dormitories or even in libraries. Um, retail, you're, you're we're looking at like pharmaceuticals or or um, or grocery stores. And these are places where, you know, like routine checkups can be done or counseling services or specialist consultations are done um, or low acuity triage. So nothing major, but things that can pretty much be um, diagnosed, you know, with a telecom. But they, yeah, this is something really serious that um, is really coming at a forefront. And we are going to be seeing a lot of these. That's interesting. Um, Kim, I'm going to come to you a little bit because kind of going off of the healthcare, I want you to talk a little bit about how are we going to see lobby spaces changing? How are waiting rooms going to change? And, um, you know, is that going to affect the whole idea of the research behind the waiting room? You know, what are we going to see? Um, I think it's, I think it's important to note First and foremost, that I heard somebody say it the other day, it was a really good way of saying this is that we're building, um, we're building the plane as we're flying it, meaning that we don't know for sure what is going to happen when it comes to these kinds of spaces. We can make educated guesses, but as the research comes in and as this thing changes on the daily, um, it's it's really difficult to tell how things are going to be. But from what we've seen thus far, I think we're going to see when it comes to respective of lobbies and open ah. spaces particularly when you think about coming into a space like when you come into a hospital, you have that kind of open area that's meant to, um, you know, encourage people to get together and chat while they're waiting to go see somebody or, um, you know, just interacting with somebody. Those are probably going to change significantly. And I've heard some some reports that they're looking at potentially those might be completely eliminated just because that dead time in between um, going to a meeting or going to an appointment, that's really a, a point of, of interaction that could cause spread. And so perhaps those areas are going to be replaced with um, areas for you to get your temperature checked before you walked in. But I think we're seeing that maybe gone are the days or um, away are the days where we get somewhere 20 minutes early and just sit and you know commiserate mm -hmm. together. I think that's going to start to change. And as unfortunate as that is, because that's uh, humans are all about interaction, right? That is unfortunate that we're going to see that. But until, like Ken said, until the vaccine is um, available, we're just going to have to continue to do make those changes as much as possible. Sure. And I want to follow up on that. And I want um, Justina to chime in as well, because I feel like Steelcase is really heads down in this. But Kim, you mentioned um, community spaces and areas where collaboration happens kind of going away. Um, what about establishing a culture in a community? How can we still establish, you know, a culture of a company without those collaboration spaces? Like, how are we going to see that happening? Um. I think that's a tough question, um, and it's a, it's an almost impossible one to answer. Some things that I have heard, um, I know for one of my um, dealerships down here in Kansas City, I mentioned protocols earlier and how those are going to change. Um, I think I think most companies and organizations understand that we can't eliminate um, getting together with people. That has to happen, right? We have to be able to share information 
face to face. That's just part of who we are. And so um, as an example, I've heard that they're going to this this one organization is going to potentially change the work week where if you work for this organization, you're either a Monday, Wednesday employee or you're a Tuesday, Thursday employee, meaning that that way we have half the people in the office. So we've cut back on how much cross contamination is occurring and um, but still able to engage with people. And then, of course, they've changed the protocols for how you meet, where you meet, when you meet, clean in, clean out, all those things I mentioned earlier. And so then you've got your Monday, Wednesday workers, your Tuesday, Thursday workers, and then the work week has been dramatically reduced because Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they're bringing in a cleaning crew to come in and get everything set back to zero and uh, make sure that everything's safe for the next week. So um, I'd be interested to see, I know Ken mentioned the semester changing. I'd be interested to see how um, you know colleges, particularly colleges, are going to handle it um, with, especially with, you know, you can only do so much in the in the school day. It's, it's the after hours, right? That maybe potentially comes an issue, Ken, where we can't, I mean, how do we shut down the bars? <laughs> like, how do we, um, <laughs> so I'd be really curious because that's, that's, I don't know if you guys saw this last weekend, there was this huge party down at the Lake of the Ozarks, which, I mean, I'm, I actually have plans to go there next month, so I'm a little bit nervous right now, but um, <laughs> I'm not part of the party cove people, but I mean, we can't control people, right? We can't tell them what they can and can't do if we can to an extent, but particularly with, with colleges, I, I really wonder how, I don't know, Ken, if you have any insight on that. And <laughs> well, my only insight is that uh, the parties will go on. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't think it's going to happen, yeah, right? Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> Maybe without happen. the alcohol, it'll kill it, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, and I think um, a lot of what we're discussing here involves a uh, behavioral change, and it really is interesting. I think there's just going to going to be different groups and different um, companies that are going to, and also at an individual level, you adapt and you. Everybody's going to make that behavioral change on their own time. Um, some may be forced to do it sooner than they're ready to, um, and then you know that also kind of um, starts from a design standpoint, what we're learning is that it also ties into not just a behavioral change, but really how we are designing these spaces for people to learn and to work in. Um, it really is going to shift our industry and in, in thinking about space planning and really layout and revolving around how we design. So it really is changing the industry altogether and taking what we, we know now and adapting and learning and moving forward instead of just completely, um, you know, erasing everything we know and starting over, we're really all learning together. Um, and what have you been hearing from a dealership standpoint as far as, you know, what are Shepherds doing to adapt to designing differently, behavioral, um, thinking differently and bringing people back into the office, Taylor? Yeah. Um so uh, I would say, first off, SBI has been phenomenal with communication. Um, there was no point that I, and again, Ken and Joe can kind of back me up or second me on, on this. There was no point that I felt anxious about having to come into the office um, despite everything that's going on. I think their communication um, is, is good. And I think it was number one. I think um, that is what companies probably need to look at is just being open and honest and communicative with their employees about how they're going to approach this phase one, phase two. Um, so as of right now, Shepherds has their showroom closed. Um, and if you uh, do have a client that needs to come in the showroom, the um, essentially it needs to be approved as to is the reason they're coming in something that could be delayed or is it something that's timely? So, um, you know, if, if finishes need to be chosen because an order needs to be placed, that's one thing. Um, or is this something that can be pushed out? So those are considerations. Um, our front desk hours have been shortened because um, that limits the exposure of our front desk team to whoever walks in the door. And then we're all working from home right now. And so um, I would say, though, our business has not floundered in any kind of way with that shift. I think, if anything, I've heard quite a few people tell me they're more productive at home because um, we are a company and a community of being able to just walk up and say, hey, I got a question. Hey, I need to talk about something. And so um, I see that that has been a change. But I also know that via Teams, which we're using, there has not been a skip in being able to reach people. You know, I, I can 
message someone on teams and say, Hey, are you busy? And they'll call me. It's, it's been a really great collaborative way, um, even though we're not together. And so I think what Shepherds is starting to look at is, um, they are planning for a reconfigure or a retrofit before any of us even think about coming back to the office. And so I think that's really healthy because, um, you know, we are going to be the leaders and right along with Steelcase, we're going to be helping our clients go back to work. So if we cannot do it ourselves, how can we help? And so I think that's the mentality that Shepherds is using is um, what we're going to talk about next are these solutions we're going to start implementing in order to get people back to work. And that's really all we know right now. You know, they're again, they're being good at communicating, but I think that nobody really knows. I think right now, because business is being is not being altered in any kind of way, um, our install team is still working, our operations team is still working, um, that we just continue as is for as long as possible. But then, you know, the people that have to be in the office or have to go out on job sites, they are the ones that are social distancing and taking in that, um, in all those considerations before visiting a client. So um, it's definitely right aligned with what we're talking about right now. I think I think too, Taylor. What's interesting as we as we kind of navigate through this is kind of where we are in the book, right? Right, like right, we're at kind of at the beginning right now, and then as the as the book goes along, things will start to change. Same thing with the design project. If you think about a design project, when this happened, all of these projects were in different phases. You had some that were in construction. You had some that were at the you know the very beginning of this. You had some that were in were, were in drawings. And so how each, particularly for us in design, each one of those phases is so vastly different, has such vastly different requirements that I'm curious to see how that will change as we move forward where you talked about how a lot of our work we've been able to do you know from home but what happens when it's time for that finished selection what time happens when it's time for needing to feel the hand of something and also be with your client so they can feel that hand or what happens when I have to deliver a chair to a client who doesn't know where that chair came from we're, we're struggling with that right now um, with steel case of we have all these road samples that is particularly like for me coming up to omaha it used to be nothing for me to throw a chair in my back the back of my car drive up for three hours drop it off let the client try it out let you guys try it out now we're looking at with contact tracing you know if there's if there's something on that chair that potentially transfers to someone else um, there's a lot of liability there there's a lot of risk there and so we are definitely trying to figure out what those protocols will be to change but also still allow our clients Clients to do what they need to do, which is to sit, test these products, to feel them, kick them, <laughs> hit them, throw them. Um, and, you know, we always used to have at least Neocon for that, right? We haven't had that. So now we're, we're getting rid of a, or having to change how we look at it, particularly from a design perspective, how we make a project happen. And I don't think we've seen the full implications of that. I think a lot of it is still coming uh, down the road. And I think, again, we're kind of building the plane as, as we fly it. But um, I do, I'm, I'm happy that we work for a company, um, whether directly or through the dealership, that is thinking about these things and is making changes as necessary. And also coming from a place of humility of being able to say, we don't necessarily know the answers yet, but we're we're working to get them. And I feel comforted knowing that, like you said at the beginning of this, Steelcase is a insight-led company. We don't do anything without researching it thoroughly first. And so I feel very confident that we're going to make the right decisions ultimately, even though it might take us a few slips along the way to get there. Yeah, I think that's great. Ken and Joe, do you have anything to add, um, maybe based off of what uh, Kim and Justina have been talking about with Shepherds? Um, you know, I'm one employee, but you guys are others. So is, are, are you having different experiences? Um, and what do you foresee, you know, when we do return to work? You know, I, I agree with you 100% um, in everything that you shared. Um, I've only, I have been with the company less than a year and um, in many, many instances there have been so many things that I feel I made the right choice in going with Shepherds. I had other opportunities prior to that and, you know, just this, um, the situation that we've been in has really brought out um, the true colors of Shepherds, and I'm really impressed with their priority as far as um, their employees. And I, what I'm seeing and what I've heard, um, I, you know, I've not heard a lot, but I know that, um, you know, the design team and leadership are really looking at what we can do in the showroom to make it safe and to be that leader. Um, 
so that we can say, yeah, this these are the things that should change to improve your work your workplace, and um, and I'm I'm really excited about that. I know that there's a lot of work to do, um, so but I I do know that they will be making the right choices. I'm I'm really confident in that. I I would agree with that as well. Uh, but I'd also add that um, when I first came to Shepherds four years ago, uh, I had a permanent workspace. Um, and then I was transitioned to what we call a nomadic uh, employee. And again, uh, you know, to Kim and Justina's point, that's part of uh, the foresight that I think Steelcase had quite a while ago is that there's going to be that kind of a shift in the workplace. So when I come to work each day, I, fa- I find a touchdown space or a space that's not being used that uh, fits those tasks that I know I need to get done that day. Uh, it could be a, a an, an alone space, you know, one of our many collaborative spaces uh, built for one or two or multiple people, or just in a community space. So um, I think we're somewhat already transitioning in that direction. So the next step quite potentially could be um, my role could be done uh, remotely, you know, with only a few visits to the office any given week or meeting a client at the office. So I think uh, with Shepherds, we may see a little bit of a shift towards that sort of thing, allowing those who can continue to work remote uh, to work remote. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Um, and that's a really great segue into kind of the, the last point that I have. Um, in talking about this is, so Steelcase, and Justina, you can touch a little bit on this too, but um, Steelcase is talking about the now, um, the future, and then the long term. And so how we are looking, or the now near far is another way you can look at it. And so it's, what we're looking at is how can you retrofit a space to be um, enough for now? How do you reconfigure a space to be um satisfactory in the future? And then what are we going to see in the long term? How is the workplace going to be reinvented? And so, um, Justina, if you want to talk a little bit about the now and the working from home, but then also maybe some retrofitting options, um, what, you know, what, what does that look like? Um, and that kind of now near far terminology was developed um, by Steelcase in the hopes that we could really help people as they go back to the workforce, establish a timeline um, to their their plan and going back to work um, and really help kind of break it down. And in all of the calls that we have had with leadership at multiple architectural firms and um, large organizations over this past eight weeks, we were learning that it's been very helpful for them to actually kind of segment their plan when they go back to work. One of the largest obstacles obviously has been addressing working from home. And I know myself even, I have, um, we have myself and my husband are both working from home. So as two uh, adults working full time, we certainly did not have two offices. And so we completely hacked the spaces and made them work. You know, right now my laptop is sitting on four books so I can raise it up. Um, I'm sitting on a stool from my kitchen and, um, but I'm making it work. And there are things that you kind of adapt and learn to do. Um, And we've also got a really great series on ergonomics that I think would be really, really helpful for anyone that is struggling with the work from home. Um, And, you know, learning how to support your wellness and your well-being. Um, and so that goes to that that mental capacity and emotional part of feeling good while you're working from home and not feeling like um, you're being forced to do something that's uncomfortable or, you know, getting up and moving around a lot. Um, and I know that Shepherds has also been really great in supporting large companies. We had a large financial institution in Omaha and they needed uh, 400 AMIA task chairs that they needed to get out to the field to their employees that they could support them in working from home. And so Steelcase shipped a partial order of those to directly to the employee's home. And some of them are also shipped to the dealership at Shepherds where the installers there put the chairs together and then hand delivered those obviously in a safe manner. 
Um, and so there's ways that we can work together with you know any company and help really adapt to that work from home. And I know there's other um, ideas out there as far as um, you know what do you need in that that current now situation. Um, any other thoughts on that from anyone on the work from home? I would love to hear from Ken. And the reason why is I think, Ken, we talked earlier um, last week. And what about e-learning? You know, talk a little bit about like how is our, you know, I think through the summer and maybe um, with you talking a little bit about how e-learning might become some of the norm. Um, what is that? What does that look like? How how are parents handling all this? Uh, great question, Taylor, and I'll, I will jump into that. But first, I'd like to go back to what J Justina just said and say that I really, really miss my standing height adjustable desk. So <laughs> when it comes to working from home, I think the ergonomics and, you know, you it, a company shouldn't just expect people to be able to create those environments at home and still be ergonom ergonomically correct and healthy for the employees. So. I'll take a standing height adjustable desk, please. Find me but, up for that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. To your point though, Taylor, yes, I think that uh, uh, distance learning, online learning, it's here to stay. The technology is moving so fast that um, it's so much easier today to use Zoom or many other platforms that are out there to, to do a very high quality uh, lesson plan with your students. I think though it's important to acknowledge that what we saw happen with almost all the schools in this crisis is, is not really online learning. In other words, uh, if you've ever taken an online class yourself through a, a school or a higher ed, higher ed institution that does online learning, you'll know that those learning platforms are supported by a learning management system specifically designed to support uh, and assist teachers and students in online learning. It's not just slapping a lesson plan on Zoom uh, and trying to uh, conduct a class. So I think we've learned a lot from this crisis that we got through, uh, but we also know a lot about what makes effective e-learning, online learning, uh, and how it's most effective with students and helpful for instructors. So uh, I do think you'll see a lot more of that put in place. Um, and I think that's going to be with us to stay. That's one of those uh, everlasting things, I think, because technology has helped us do it well. Right. That's interesting. Um, Joe, do you have anything from a, from an Arc Solutions perspective that kind of fits into that retrofitting, um, you know, reducing density, creating division? I feel like um, demountable products and division kind of go hand in hand. So, Sure. Are you seeing a change in your product? Are you seeing it used more often? Sure. So, you know, a couple of the things that, you know, is reducing density, obviously, that would mean the yeah. number of people in a given space. Uh, we do have a system um, that is called Live Map, Steelcase Live Map. And basically, what the system provides is visual cues for density in the workplace. Um, it's a large scale digital map that uh, shows in real time availability of rooms and you know uh, rooms desks and workstations and workplaces um, it's shown on the standard display and it's usually you know like i said it's placed in a high traffic area uh, of buildings for easy visibility and the software basically is uh, scheduling data from office 365 and um, the occupancy data from the workplace advisor sensors. So there are sensors that are in um, these spaces. And what that does, is they communicate together. The software communicates together with this live map and it gives you an up to the minute availability. So it really minimizes the unnecessary contact. You know, when you're looking for a space to work, you just need to look at the live map and go, OK, this space here is open and you can go directly to that space. So that's one option that um, would be easily retrofitted into a current space. Um, as far as a um, architecture solutions uh, uh, product, uh, Post and Beam is a product that we have um, that organizations can find 
um, to retrofit spaces, even like open spaces that they currently have now. And what it does is it reduces density and encourages, you know, physical distancing and also reduces face to face interactions. It can add basically what it does. It can add division to a space through screens and panels for proximity um, protection. So post and beam is an architectural. It's basically it's a framework with very minimal footprint. And um, it's the infills are retrofitable, so you can use um, like solid um, plastic screens or you can use fabric. There's a lot of different options that you can use to retrofit inside that. Um, there's also even brackets that are integrated into it so that you can have uh, technology, uh, digital technology available to go with that. So it's it's installed pretty quickly. It provides, you know, safe environments and it still gives a sense of community. And I think that's the one thing when we're talking about, you know, coming back and people feeling safe, you know, and I think I've, that's this has been a repeat, but that there is still needs to be a sense of community because we still, you know, that's something that's been becoming ingrained in this for quite a few years in the workplace. And I think that's something that we're we're still going to want. So I think that post and beam is a really uh, easy answer um, for for dividing and as well as, um, you know, density. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And Joe, kind of going off of that density, what about sound masking? You know, um, no people in the office is going to be so quiet. So how right. do you combat, combat that? Sure. Yeah. Sound masking is definitely going to be important, even, you know, with less people. Um, so, <clears throat> basically, you know, it's going to be a quiet space, right? Because you're not going to have as many people there. Think of a think of it as like a library, you know, and if there's not any additional um, noise in that library, you can hit hear a pin drop, right? So with the sound masking, what it can do is it kind of um, muffles the sound. So there's really two different things when we're talking about acoustics that uh, there's between audibility and intelligibility. So ba so basically what we're saying that there's one thing about hearing a conversation that is happening 20 feet away that is um, that you know that you can hear it and then there there's a completely different um, in that that you can actually understand the conversation, right? So in having the sound masking and we have a product called QT Pro, what that does is it kind of muffles that and so it it helps eliminate you being able to like make just a really you know, a phone call and then somebody 20 feet away actually hearing every single word that you're, sh you're saying. So that would be another thing um, that I would recommend is having that QT Pro. Very easy to install, minimal as far as cost, um, very easy to use. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect. And that also relates to like the telehealth in the office, right? If you had to go do um, a telehealth meeting with your doctor, both materiality and sound masking are going to play a huge factor because you would want to go in a very, very private room right. with no windows and not want anyone to hear what you're talking about. Well, I think too, the technology, like what you were saying, Joe, with Room Wizard, that's going to become, or whatever technology that you use is going to become so important because we talked earlier about how we're probably going to see a, an elimination or at least a, a decrease in the amount of those lobby gathering areas because we want to be able to go straight to that room, get do what we need to do, talk to who we need to talk to, and then leave quickly. Where in the past, if you went to a doctor's office, we all have been there and sat there for an hour, especially as someone who's been a mother. That's it, Justine, I know you know what I'm talking about. You go in the waiting room for there for sometimes hours at a time. So mm -hmm. to have some sort of, of technology to be able to say this is this room's not ready for you yet. Maybe it pings the person who's who is does have to come into the office and says we're running 20 minutes behind. You know, you need to wait or, or whatever that technology will change everything and how we and how we interact in the healthcare environment and just overall. And something that I think Ken kind of touched on earlier with with education. I was thinking about this about how you know, for us, this is such a huge change. This is this is literally a complete 180 from what we're used to dealing with. And I think about those younger students who, um, if you think about like 9-11, how, how we got on a plane before 9-11 to what happened after 9-11, right? And it was for us that were that lived through it, it felt very painful. It felt very um, taxing and, and stressful. Um, for my stepdaughters who are 19 and 16 or 19 and 17 now, that's all they know. So they, they don't even realize there's been a change. And we're having a whole generation of people who who are not even this is going to be their lifestyle forever it's not i mean that we have for are forever changed and so i think it's really interesting how we'll bridge that gap between people who um grew up with this and are are going to be on e-learning all the time versus those who are kind of in the middle of it like my stepdaughters or people who have been out of it 
Like we are, it's a whole other thing that's bringing us together in this very unique, interesting way. And I'm curious to see how that will play out over time. Yes, I, I think you're right. It's, uh, I think it is an epic, long-term transformational change for education. Uh, it'll be with us for a long, long time. And it's a very exciting time. Uh, I've heard, uh, particularly from the higher ed community, uh, there's some excitement around the ability to brainstorm, come up with unique solutions, interesting solutions, and get them implemented quickly. Uh, within educational institutions, think of large school districts or universities, the decision-making process is famous for being very, very <laughs> slow and painful. Uh, I, I don't think that necessarily they are just stuck on tradition. It's just that they don't want to go through the painful decision-making right. process that they have to go through. But right now, all that's out the window. I mean, you come up with a great idea, you come up with something we need to implement now, and you can get it through the system much quicker. So there is a lot of excitement out there around this transformation uh, that is upon us. And doesn't, don't you think, Ken, too, that it's it's opened our eyes to not just COVID, like we keep talking about COVID, post-COVID, pre-COVID, whatever, but really this is something that's been around for a long time. Pandemics have been an issue in our in our nation's history for, for hundreds of years. It just so happens that we're having this one in this moment in time, and I think it's forcing us to, like you said, you know, it's, it's forcing the issue to say, we can't, we can't say we'll do it later. It has, it's now, we have to do it now. So we may as well start planning now for the next one that's coming along. And I think that, that it's forcing those protocol changes and those changes to, to education and how we interact with each other that we're, that aren't going to go away anytime soon. It's just, it's just the new norm. Um, as difficult as that may be, it, it's just, it's forcing the change. It's like when you have a really dirty house and you, throw a party and it's like, oh, I have to clean the house now because the party's going to be here any minute. The, the COVID party is here. So we right. have to. Yes. I think that's <laughs> we absolutely right. Yep. Yep. It's the absolutely. first time I've heard COVID re referred to as a party, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just keeping it light, you know. I love it. I do want to touch on one more thing um, and then we'll kind of open it up to is any if anyone has any closing thoughts or anything like that. But um, and this is mainly, I, I want to go around and we'll start with Justina. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, okay, re reconfigurations and reinvention. So if you could touch on, you know, workstations, how are those going to look? You know, the, the normal before COVID was to the less real estate per person was the goal. And now I feel like it's going backwards. So how are we going to see that change, especially with workstations and um, even private offices? Yeah, good question. Um, and, you know, what we have learned um, in the past and that we are uh, implementing now is that really it deals with, like we talked about earlier, density and um, spacing people out, but also geometry. So currently, if workstations are facing each other, um, you know, turn those workstations 90 degrees and um, or separate them with some distance and use some privacy screen screens or some boundary screens. Um, and also utilizing those screens throughout uh, the collaborative areas. I know that Kim touched on earlier. Um, and again, that's part of that uh, that reconfiguration and and then looking at the space as a whole and determining, like Kim said, maybe half the workforce goes back um, part time and the other half goes back the other part time just to reduce that contact and uh, mitigate the risk of everyone being in that space at the same time. I know Kim maybe could collaborate on what you're seeing also with the collaboration areas and, and if you already have those existing collaboration spaces, it doesn't mean that you have to get rid of them, but there are ways to reconfigure and make them still, you know, less dense. Yeah, I think it will. I think it will change with with how each organization feels about what they're allowing and how they're allowing their people to interact. But in those areas where you have to have collaboration, and of course, being in the design field, that's where my mind immediately goes. Is is when we sit down and talk about a floor plan and talk about, um, you know, who's going to be where and matrices, matrices, and all of those. That's all things that have to be done with somebody. And so there are some things that we can do. Um, products that we can implement or retrofit. Um, as an example, if you've got 
um, you know, a, a large bench and it's a back to back bench application like we've seen a lot and especially in cafes where you have people that are dining together. Um, even just adding a screen to the back of, of that back to back um, can help eliminate that kind of cross contamination because then obviously droplets wouldn't be able to hop over and so that can help um, help with that a little bit. I think we don't want to go too far in which we're basically sitting and eating in, in a bathroom stall like nobody wants to, <laughs> to be um, having a meal that way, but I think we can still encourage distancing through um, separate areas um, with dining or just gathering in general. Um, and again, it's it's mostly going to be through screening. It's going to be through maybe it's a plant, maybe it's um, some biophilia, which is important anyway. We before this all started, um, Steelcase had really kind of bought into and and believes in uh, heavily that that biophilia is really important for your wellness and your your mental state, and even more so now with all of this stressful stuff that's going on, um, that becomes even more important as well. But now you know to have it serve double duty now it's not only just making us feel better um, with the greenery but also it's creating some some division so we can implement those as well um, storage pieces can sometimes act as as division um, steelcase is working on a lot of ancillary thought starters for how you can kind of hack the space to make it more um, friendly for for distancing and, and we'll have some of those coming out shortly and i think those will be really helpful one thing i think that is is if there can be a silver lining to all of this is that mother's rooms are finally becoming something that is important and is being recognized as important. So I'm hoping that this um, will no longer see the, the mother's rooms located in a restroom. Hopefully we'll start to see those individual rooms become more important and, and um, accessible for, for those that need them. So fingers crossed that that, that change happens. And um, Ken, do you mind touching on, we talked a little bit about college experience, but like, could you talk a little bit about how you think the classroom might look with furniture, but also like dorms? How are dorms going to look? How are we going to prevent infection spread in, in dormitories where people are living? Boy, dorms are a tough one. Um, I was talking to some people this last week who had um, young students going back to dorms. Actually, this was someone who, was, who had student, a freshman going away. And that school was able to put uh, students in an individual uh, room in a suite setup where they each had their own bathroom, they each had a bedroom, and they shared a common space, just two students. Um, that sounds ideal, but I think that's not the norm. That's by far the exception. So uh, that's one of those major questions that universities are going to need to wrestle with. Um, and I certainly don't have the answers for them if they don't have the luxury of having that kind of space. Um, in terms of classrooms, I think when you when you think about K-12 in particular, um, certainly we can't put the same number of students in the same classroom square footage that we have in the past. So um, the answers to that scenario in the near term, this next school year, would be how do you utilize those underutilized spaces within your building? So how do you transition your cafeteria into learning spaces throughout the day or your gym or your auditorium or whatever, uh, your libraries? Uh, you you're going to need to make use of every single square foot of your space every minute of the day. Um, the the products that we have out there in terms of furniture uh, in many ways will will make that easier for you if you have the flexible, adaptable, movable furniture uh, that many schools have already been transitioning to. Uh, that way you can transition a classroom space or a, um, a large uh, cafeteria space into a learning space relatively quickly or if you need it to look differently in the next period, you can make it look differently in the next period. Uh, I think another thing that I've heard talked about that I, I see coming is, I mentioned those crowded hallways uh, when students uh, transition during a bell period. I believe students will stay in one classroom largely as opposed to moving room to room, and the teachers will be the person moving from room to room. So that would mean that instead of designing or furnishing a classroom for a particular topic that's going to be the same topic all day long, it's going to need to be transitional, uh, changeable to support any uh, pedagogy or topic that the teacher needs needs to deliver. Um, mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of things that I think uh, are imminent and that we will see in this next school year. 
Uh, I don't think the schools have time to do physical reconfigurations to any large extent. Uh, they're going to have to make do with what they have. What about funds when it comes to, you know, they just the CDC just released guidelines or at least here in, in Missouri they did of what they are thinking the new school year will need to be at least for this year, maybe not for the long term, but for the short term. And it was pretty intense changes, you know, no, no eating anything that's not prepackaged, no recess, no gym time, all of those things. And I've seen a lot of, I mean, you shouldn't ever read the comment section, but I did. And um, <laughs> you know, there was a lot of people who said, forget it, I'm pulling my kid, I'm going to do homeschooling. Schools on the whole already don't have a ton of extra funds just laying around. So if you have this mass exodus of people who aren't going to be sending their kids to school and therefore are not interested in, you know, feeding funds to to different, what does that do for these schools having to make these huge changes that are costly? Do, do you have any insight on that, Ken? Well, I know that there was some money provided under the uh, relief acts that were passed. Um, I know, for example, here in uh, the metro area, uh, our local school district, Omaha Public Schools, used a large amount of that money to buy uh, mobile devices for all their students. Uh, so there is some funding available to do those things, but there's certainly not enough to do them all. Uh, so how they raise that money or trim their budgets to uh, fit that scenario is another one of those huge challenges that they have. Uh, higher ed, I think it's even more challenging. Right. I believe they also right. had some relief funding, but more so than in public education, when students don't come to their schools, they lose revenue significantly, right? If you're not getting paid tuition, you don't have revenue. So I know our large university systems and colleges here locally are already making budget cuts. They're already eliminating staff. They're already trimming uh, because they know that their revenue is not going to be what it was. So funding is another one of those key issues. So making do with what you have uh, in every area that you can uh, makes even more sense. That made me think of, um, in, in parallel to the corporate environment, Ken, on what you're saying with, you know, making do with what you have and um, utilizing the spaces that uh, might be underutilized. I think a lot of corporations are running into an issue of, okay, if we do make uh, these spaces less dense, where do we put this furniture? We, we didn't plan on storing half of our workstations. Um, and so, you know, some discussions have been had of, well, perhaps you use a conference room now becomes a storage room for those workstations. And so there's also things kind of going on there with organizations as they think about, you know, actually making these spaces less dense and instead of having to move, let's just use what we have. So there, there are certainly, um, you know, challenges there as well on the corporate side. You make a good point, Justina. I was just talking to a client the other day who was there looking at reconfiguring some some spaces, and so they were looking at um, conference rooms, and they were talking about how they can maybe take take the desk or not the desk, the um, table that was this huge, you know, twenty foot by twenty foot huge gargantuan thing. And what happens if we do basically have that be as a classroom environment now, and everybody's separated out in different areas with maybe a, maybe a movable screen, right, that we can bring in and have and divide that out and have it not only be the conference, then, then we can pull everything out and everybody can sit in a giant circle or something. How are we going to reconfigure these to make this the spaces more flexible? And that I think that flexibility component is going to continue to be really important. And each each um, organization is going to have to look at how they do that. Um, is it getting like like Ken said, getting rid of a cafe space and making now that's a, a training area? Who knows? It's 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 just going to be completely different than what we have have come to expect. And it's just going to be. The ingenuity, I think, is going to come out of this that we're going to see is going to be phenomenal. Um, all these products that are going to come out of, of because of COVID, we're going to be like, how did we live without these before now? Well, and then also, you know, as far as architecture solutions products, and when we're talking about flexibility and making these changes, we do have a product called Thread, which is our, um, our under flooring uh, system, which provides an electrical outlet for somebody that is now sitting in a space that wasn't used for um, a, a sit down place, you know, for somebody with a, a laptop. So that is uh, like, you know, that is a very easy install, um, very uh, limited as far as fun, you know, funds. Um, it is not a very expensive system to put in, but that would be something that's very doable um, to 
provide power for those people that need it for their laptops. And and I'm even talking as far as even schools, you know, um, it, that is a really great solution uh, for that, that is going to be needed. I think that too, just moving forward when in terms of these areas where, especially like with education, um, sports is such a huge part of that, right? Where, I mean, that's how the universities are making a lot of their money is through the sports programs. And how do we, en how do we enjoy sports moving forward if, if, I mean, as you guys have all sat in an arena where it's, you know, you have this much space. And so um, I, I think that we're seeing a lot of research around how we can, is it a screen between each person or is it just a, is it one of those things where the school or the the, the company or the sports um, manager has to say, it's come at, at your own risk and understand that you might be at um, an, an area where you are more exposed because we can't get rid of sports. We can't pretend that those things don't happen. So I'm, um, it, it'll be really interesting to see how that comes about with with all of these changes that we're we're going to see in every single vertical market. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think all of these things surround kind of that long term goal of the now, near, and far. It's really all about these are ways that we're reinventing the way that we think and work and teach and learn, and it's just going to be our new abnormal, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate each and every one of you because I think that um, there's a lot of COVID noise out there. And so I think us being able to come together and see us as a united front to Omaha to be a resource um, is very important. And so I really appreciate each of you being here with me. Um, is there anything else that we might want to add before we wrap up that anyone has? Yeah, you know, one of the things that um, I really didn't talk a lot about is um, the demountable walls systems that we have. You know, I've always proposed the benefit of modularity and, and the ability to change space for the purpose of growth and downsizing of a company. Um, modularity is important now more than ever as the future is really unknown. You know, we really um, not we're not only just like looking at modularity for the reason of downsizing or growth as a factor and how space and real estate is being used. Now we're really thinking about it um, as far as, you know, future effects and for future pandemics, you know, in the crisis. Um, the value that we really place on the return on investment for our demandable wall systems, it really comes at the forefront now as the future changes are really inev inevitable. Um, our demanding wall systems become a really win-win situation for meeting rooms now that are being designed with a uh, focus in keeping um, the recommended space between people. You know, initially, and when I was thinking about smaller spaces, it in um, I was thinking, well, it's going to be, you know, the meeting spaces are not going to need to be smaller. But in reality, there really kind of needs to be more of a balance in that because, um, you know, we're, we're also needing to accommodate that that six foot rule right for everybody that's being recommended so now we're we're also needing to look at the room as far as six foot as far as you know everyone being you no know, you know maybe three people being in this room but as far as envisioning somebody getting up to say use a uh, a whiteboard or getting up out to go to you know to leave you know, do you have that space in between each other to actually move around and, and do those things? So, you know, the one thing that we're really fortunate about as far as um, shepherds that we really do have a lot of talented um, designers and they can really design spaces that are going to really meet those these all these dynamics and all of these changes. Um, one of the things, too, is that, you know, now the number of people using Teams and Zoom has significantly increased, right? And so the way that we have envisioned business travel, it's just really shifted. And people are now finding that using technology is just as productive. So I think we're going to also see shifts in um, needing more focus rooms, where it's just going to be maybe just one person, um, where that's going to provide an environment for like a Teams or a Zoom meeting. So, you know, really, I, I really recommend really looking at demountable walls because of the flexibility that it, it has. And um, and yeah, just really going to be interesting to see all the changes that we that we're all going to be facing here in, in the future. I think that's a great point. Taylor, I, I would also add, and, and um, two things I didn't mention that I'm really proud of our education community for thinking about and paying attention to is that, you know, through the crisis we've been through, uh, there's been some, uh, some students have fallen behind further than normal. And through the course of this summer, there's going to be even more of that. 
So academic uh, remediation when the students do come back to school is critically important. And I hear a lot of conversation around that. The other thing that goes a little bit hand in hand with that is the whole is social emotional uh, wellness factor uh, for the kids when they come back to school. Um, you know, this is this has been traumatic on everyone, uh, but I think probably even more so on the kids. And you don't often you're not often able to actually uh, see that with them or hear them voice that, but you know what's going on. So uh, those are those are both big things I think, and I'm really proud of the education community for thinking about that and coming up with ways to address that. Uh, when we get back together. The other point I'll make, and for me, this is this is this is ending on a high note for me. I believe, uh, Kim, there will be sports, there will be fans in stands, uh, there will be parters, parties. Uh, you know, we are a social being, right? And uh, I don't think the long-term changes uh, will be as drastic as we're planning for right now, uh, because there is a race to the vaccine, right? Sure. Uh, the yeah. smartest yeah. scientists in the world. Uh, are all working right now as hard as they can possibly work to be the first ones to come out with that vaccine, right? Because uh, they'll make a gazillion dollars. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> it, They're incentivized. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there is a bright future ahead of us for sure. I agree. I agree. I think that's a fantastic note to end on. So mm -hmm. I appreciate each and every one of you. It was great to see your faces. And um, if anyone listening needs, uh, you know, has questions, or um, comments, I feel like I sound like one of those uh, ASPCA commercials, <laughs> you know, call the number at the bottom of the screen. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, you, you know we'll, we will provide our information so you can reach out to us. Um, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to chat with you. And um, again, this is a moving conversation. So we may have another one of these in a month and it's going to look completely different. So um, until then, we appreciate you listening and um, thank you, everyone. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Taylor. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you, Taylor. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Joe. Bye, Ken.